Welcome to this special edition of Canton Confidential, the Karen Reed murder trial. I'm Glenn Jones. I'm JC Monahan. Today, Judge Beverly Canoni heard arguments about dropping two charges against Reed. She's accused of hitting and killing her Boston police officer boyfriend, John O'Keefe, with her SUV, leaving him to die in the snow. During the first trial, her attorneys claimed Reed was being framed by police. The prosecution claimed it was a cold blooded killing. A retrial is scheduled for January. You'll recall Reed was charged with second degree murder, manslaughter, and leaving the scene of the crash. But the case ended in a mistrial after the jury could not reach a verdict. However, multiple jurors after the mistrial declaration have allegedly claimed the entire jury agreed Reed was not guilty on the first and third count, and they were only deadlocked on the manslaughter charge. Here's what both legal teams had to say today in court. We can't just accept the fiction that the jury was at an impasse on all three counts. It was quite a twisting of logic into sort of a pretzel in order to have uh, the circumstances of this case fit into the precedent. So with Karen Reed back in court, demonstrators were back outside the court. Her supporters and critics were out demonstrating today, and we spoke with people from both camps. We're upset that they're actually framing an innocent woman and covering up to protect a, uh, a Boston police officer and his family. I would say the biggest problem with this case was that what was put out for the last two years came strictly from the defense side, whether it was true or not. Um, and that came from the defense side, but also via bloggers, um, YouTubers, who decided to jump on this. They saw the dollar signs um, and start spreading the misinformation and the lies for two years. People are still very entrenched. Let's go live outside the courthouse right now. NBC 10's Eli Rosenberg joining us there for more with today's hearing. Well, J.C., things really going back and forth inside that courtroom and passion arguments on both sides out here. It was quite loud. And after all of it, Karen Reed reacting. Good luck, everybody. Karen Reed back in court. Wow. Looking good, Karen. Looking to end her legal troubles once and for all. Prosecutors, though, with other ideas. I'm declaring a mistrial in this case. The latest courtroom action following a mistrial in Reed's nine week long murder trial back on July 1st. And the founding fathers wanted citizens not to have to face re prosecution. Reed's lawyers arguing two of the three charges Reed faced in that first trial and could face in a second should be thrown out. Reed's lawyers saying they were approached by several jurors telling them the jury agreed Reed wasn't guilty on two of the three charges, including murder but never told the court. There's quite a twisting of logic into sort of a pretzel in order to have uh, the circumstances of this case to calm off more. Anyone wants to uh, try someone who has been acquitted by a jury of the or retry them for the same. That's not what's happening. But Reed's lawyer is telling the judge there was precedent, including during the Boston Marathon bombing trial, to call jurors back. They implored the judge to so, do so here. Order here, judge. Don't make Ms. Reed be the first person in the history of the Commonwealth to face re-prosecution for murder by the same prosecutor's office that tried her once and failed to persuade the jury. Meanwhile, outside of court, hundreds gathering yet again, those supporting Reed wearing pink. We ain't got no quit! And those in blue demanding justice for John O'Keefe. The two sides divided as ever. Karen is guilty, and we are here to support the family and get justice for John. We're upset that they're actually framing an innocent woman and covering up. After the hearing, Reed leaving, weaving through the crush of the crowd. Always strong, moving, always. Let's go. I will not be broken. Sean. You will not break me. So in the end, the hearing lasting just over an hour, no immediate decision from the judge. She said she's going to take all of this under consideration. And right now, no timeline when the judge's decision may be handed down. Live in Dedham, Eli Rosenberg, NBC10 Boston. All right, Eli, we're joined now by NBC10 legal analyst Michael Coyne and dean of the Mass School of Law. And, of course, our courtroom insider, Sue O'Connell. Michael, I want to mention to you the last time that we spoke, which was, what, now more than a month ago, you said the defense would have an uphill battle trying to get this motion to be accepted. What did you think of Marty Weinberg, who was the, the, on the defense this time? We hadn't seen him before and the way he presented things. Marty Weinberg's a terrific lawyer, one of the best 
uh, in the business. I used to watch him try cases back in the 70s in Suffolk Superior when I was in college. Uh, he and his partner have always been terrific lawyers. The problem is we have to work with the law that we have and the facts that exist. I thought he made a terrific argument, he made a, a number of good points, uh, but at the end of the day, you need to look at what the law says and the likelihood of uh, Judge Canoni changing uh, this verdict that's been in place at this point, which is no verdict, is very low. Trial judges tend to follow the law. If you want the law to be changed, that's going to take the appellate level. Someone's taken an appeal on this decision. So, Michael, the way I see it, there are two pillars of our justice system that are at issue here. In the one case, the verdict, the decision of a jury, read in open court, needs to be final. That is in a box, and we probably shouldn't tamper with that. But on the other hand, the same jury is saying, actually, our decision when we were deliberating was that she was acquitted on two charges, that we were going to say that she is not guilty. So when the judge looks at these two boxes, which pillar is she going to say has to be protected? Because in this case, only one of them can be. It's a great question. Uh, the fact is, not all the jurors have come forward and said that we had a unanimous verdict and actually voted on counts one and three. Some have. Uh, and so that's part of the problem here is where we've got something uh, that's unsettled. The jury in open court gave the judge a note. The judge accepted the verdict. No one questioned the verdict at the time. The defense didn't ask that the juries be, jurors be polled or that if they had a verdict on any of the counts that were before them. It's, it's a difficult decision because a lot of us sit here and say, yeah, but it does sound like they had a verdict on two of the counts. Uh, shouldn't the law at least say, did you have a verdict? But there's a lot of law that gets very concerned about invading that jury space and actually asking them about internal deliberations. I thought Attorney Weinberg made a great point about, well, is it, are we really invading the jury's province by asking about internal deliberations? Aren't we really just saying, what were your results at the end of the day? I don't see it being successful. Uh, simply because it opens a door that I don't think the court is likely want to want to have opened. So you've been in the courtroom for this entire mm -hmm. trial. Here we are back now, almost a month after the, the original hung jury. Judge Canoni, how is she holding up? <laughs> and how did she seem when it came to having someone new step up and, and uh, speak for the defense? Well, I th it was a different energy, of course. Um, and I imagine he's appeared before her. I, I would be shocked if, if he hasn't appeared before her. He was exceptionally eloquent and, and really a storyteller without being condescending. He made things clear. She actually looked like she was sitting back and smiling and enjoying what he was saying. Now, that doesn't mean she agreed with him, and it doesn't mean that she is definitely going to say, OK, we're going to drop the charges. But there was definitely a more relaxed attitude you could get from Judge Bev Canoni, just sitting there and following the argument and hearing what he's going to say. And a couple of times, you lean forward a little bit like, oh, yeah, that's, that's where I thought he would end up. So I think she, if one can enjoy your job, I think she enjoyed listening to him today. So it was a different atmosphere. Yeah, he had the hardest argument to make, but he did a really, really nice job. Yes. Right. Sue, Michael, thank you. When Ken Confidential returns, more fallout from Trooper Michael Proctor's testimony in the Karen Reed trial. We want to look at the ongoing impact Trooper Michael Proctor has had on the Karen Reed murder trial and beyond. Proctor was the lead investigator in this case. Testifying at her trial, he came under fire for texts that he sent family, friends, colleagues, and superiors within the Mass State Police. NBC10 exclusively obtained a letter sent to more than a dozen criminal defense attorneys who are handling cases where Proctor was also the lead investigator. We spoke with an attorney who received that letter for one of his cases. We all want uh, law enforcement um, to be doing the best they possibly can on any given case. Clearly, that wasn't done in the Karen Reed trial, and that's going to have ripple effects for everybody. The letter sent by the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office indicates that Proctor was cross-examined on issues such as conflict of interest and bias. We're joined now by Morgietta Duressier, a criminal defense attorney with the Bay State Law Group. Morgietta, the person who just left the set, told us weeks ago we should be on the lookout for this kind of development. So can you help us understand what kind of injury does Michael Proctor potentially do to other criminal cases that he's been involved in? Absolutely. And we're talking about ripple effects here, right? When you put uh, a person on the stand in any jury case, they are the evidence, right? This is what you have to rely on. So now if you can't rely on that piece of evidence, 
what can you rely on, right? You can have your exhibits, you can have um, other things that put the case together, but testimony is crucial. And so this is going to have negative impacts if they continue to do these investigations because who knows what else happened in all these other cases. Do you expect some cases to fail because of this? You know, I, I kind of, you know, I hate to put it compared to other cases, but this was like the Annie Dukin, you know, mm -hmm. fiasco that happened many years ago. And, you know, it's kind of growing to that, that, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people might be putting that into question like they did those cases back then. Just to, re to remind everybody that she was falsifying some test results labs, that came yep. from labs, yes, so that people who are incarcerated may not have been guilty after all. Absolutely. We have two other uh, d officers that are being investigated related to the Karen Reed trial. That's Detective Lieutenant Brian Tully and Sergeant Yuri Buchanan. As you said, ripple effects, that's two more. So we could possibly be seeing three officers impacting cases that has to then send those ripples even farther. Absolutely. And then the question is, you know, we're still waiting for this major decision, right, on this motion. If you do try this case again, can you even use any of that information or them in the future? Because now you're calling to question the totality of, you know, the crux of the case. You're talking about lead prosecutor. You're talking about people who are heavily involved in these matters. It does make a difference. So you have to be very cautious about that. In terms of the communication that went out to the defense attorneys, the prosecuting the prosecutor's office, the Norfolk County DA, had to send letters to these attorneys and said, hey, this is what happened. This is the testimony. Um, we're being transparent here. Why did they have to do that? They do, because remember, they represent the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, right? They're not just the district attorney's office. They represent the people who live in the Commonwealth, and they have to be forthright. They can't withhold this information, even if it makes them look bad, right, and mm -hmm. that's what it does, they have to, they have to be upfront. Okay. Orgy, it is. Always thank you. Thank the you. Karen Reed trial has had a massive impact on the town of Canton. We're looking at the deep star scars in this small community. Canton Confidential continues right after this. It has been another busy day at the courthouse in Denham, but every twist and turn in that Norfolk County courtroom is felt two towns over in Canton. NBC 10's Eli Rosenberg is in Canton with the impact this case continues to have there. As another day fades away in Canton, from above, it appears to be a town at peace. Take your hands off! Yeah. Yeah. On the ground, though, the Karen Reed case, mistrial, and uncertain future taking a toll. The town is kind of divided, I think. Everybody has a point of view, of course. In that division about a case set here, but the focus of international attention playing out in a variety of ways. But you can see it, it's got a splatter. From allegations of balloons full of bleach thrown at homes here. To Jonathan Como, who spent Tuesday night dressed as a chicken, upset by what he says is a lack of transparency by the select board. Now, I look ridiculous. Yes, I look ridiculous, but I'm not crazy. I'm here looking ridiculous to show how ridiculous their actions are. As Mark Twain once said, we are all like the moon. We all have a dark side. That, that you don't see. Jeffrey Zizel is the director of the Center for Health Resources and a clinical social worker. He says this has evolved past interest. You have to move back to a passion. Considering that, there is no surprise divisions can run deep. So I think part of it's an element of narcissism. It's an element that says, well, you clearly are incorrect because this is how I think. But this is unprecedented. There's never been a case like this. Attorney Brian Simino says an unprecedented case, bringing an unprecedented reaction for those who feel so tightly intertwined with what happens. These people come here on their own time. From using vacation days from work to be outside court, to making signs, Reed. to voicing support for Reed. I had a her words my mind. Or opposition. To every twist and turn in this case. How does it feel to be known as a cop killer, Karen? It's unbelievable the damage that this has done to the community of Canton. There needs to be a, a lot of healing and fence mending, and th th there will be scars uh, for years left by this case, no matter what the outcome. 
And while there remains so much unknown about how all of this will proceed, the fence mending is underway here in Canton. Case in point, the town is waiting the results of an independent audit into the police department and talking with the experts, they tell us as long as both sides are willing to listen to the other side, there is a path forward. In Canton, Eli Rosenberg, NBC 10 Boston. Sue O'Connell joining us again. Sue, you were there. You saw the commotion outside mm -hmm. court. I mean, it's the middle of summer. It's not like it was a month, month and a half ago when the trial came to an end, but still a lot of drama. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's drama and it isn't, JC. It's very interesting. We see the yelling. We see people with the bullhorns. We see them expressing themselves and their beliefs. But at the same time, there's uh, not a lot of interaction between the groups. The police have asked them to stay separate, and they do, so there's not any tussles or aggression or anybody getting in each other's faces. But at the same time, you know, there's, there's a commonality that they all share that they keep missing that they share, right? They all want justice mm -hmm. for John Keefe. They just have a different belief on how that should come about. Many of the people I went into, the, the blue shirts, the O'Keefe family supporters, they often complain that they don't get enough airtime. No one is talking to them, but they also don't, some say, want to talk because they don't want to be targeted for being anti-Karen Reed. So I went into the crowd several times. I gave out my business card. A couple of people did talk to us, which we got to share with our viewers tonight. And I asked them, I said, what about how the police did investigating this? Can't we all agree that maybe the Canton police and the, the Massachusetts State Police should have done a better job investigating this, and then maybe we can agree on that, and that's something that we can fix moving forward. And some, you know, agreed, and some said, well, that's a distraction. Karen Reed did it, you know. So there's still a lot of movement to get here, but to the point, you know, you get dug in in your opinion, and if you don't have a way to keep an open mind, it's going to be hard to change your mind and hear facts differently for both sides, all sides. Okay. Very true. Sue, thank you. You're welcome. We know you're engaging with a lot of people online about this case, too. How do the online interactions differ from what we're seeing outside the courthouse? That's a topic we'll be tackling in the future. All right, Kent Confidential continues after this. So O'Connell is back with us. We shouldn't leave before talking a little bit about how the furor started, and that is online. Right. Has the engagement, the, the furor, died down since the mistrial declaration? No. <laughs> it hasn't intensified even. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of personal battles that are now happening online. It used to be, I think, at the beginning there were just disagreements about things, but now people, individuals, are angry at each other and attacking each other, doxing each other, threatening defamation suits, threatening civil suits. Much of it is all, you know, not at all grounded. You know, I've had a, a whole spree of folks coming after me for things that I didn't say or they misinterpreted that I said. And my view, as, you know, J.C.'s known me a long time, I'm from Revere. Just say it in my face, right? <laughs> right. You know, so <laughs> I'll go there and walk up to these people that I know, and I say, well, you said this about me. And in person, they're delightful and lovely and nice. So I think we just need to remember that we're all real people here, mm -hmm. and I think we all want the same thing, which is to find justice for John O'Keefe. Which is exactly what we want to remember, is that this is about John O'Keefe getting justice for him, getting justice for his family, and his loved ones as well. There you see him. John O'Keefe was 46 years old. At the time of his death, he was a police officer for the city of Boston for 16 years. He was the legal guardian of his niece and nephew after the passing of his sister. John O'Keefe, 46 years old.